Sam borrowed money from a shell company, which borrowed money from Alameda, which borrowed money from BlockFi. And it was with that money with which he bought his 7% stake in Robinhood. It's fucking crazy. That is wild. I did not know that. Even thinking about the effect of altruism, you know, going to crypto Bahamas and seeing where they lived, right? This is very antithetical to the sort of, I drive a Corolla mantra that that was put out there. When you think of this whole situation, what's the like single most surprising part? All right, guys, bang, bang. I've got Frank here, the uh, third best podcaster in all of the Bitcoin crypto world. I'm the first, Peter McCormick is second, you're a third, fair? I think that that's debatable, but <laughs> it's your show, so I can't argue with you. When I come on yours, you say you're first. I'll say I'm first and you'll, <laughs> and be, you'll be second. I'll actually give you a spot above Peter. Yeah, that's perfect. All right. Uh, there's all kinds of stuff going on. I figured you'd be the perfect person to talk about the events that have transpired, but then also we can kind of go back and forth, ask some questions, whatever. Uh, first, what's your read on the whole FTX situation? Like, how did this happen? How did this happen? Yeah. Um, I mean, that's- Tell us everything. That's a loaded question. Well, le- well, where where can we start? We can start with the fact that um, clearly there were a lot of things that were going on behind the scenes that gave us sort of there were like little morsels of evidence, if we can use that word. Okay. Um, going to the fact that there were these two firms that were very intertwined, and we all kind of knew that that was a little strange, but we never kind of pulled the thread. I think a lot of people asked questions about it. So that was one factor. It turns out that they were very intertwined, not only intertwined, but FTX, or rather Alameda, was able to leverage the customer deposits on FTX to some, in some shape or form. Mm-hmm. It could have been a backdoor that Sam created. He claims he did not. He claims he can't even code. Um, it could have been uh, just the fact that Alameda was just borrowing from FTX based on the deposits there. So clearly that relationship, which a lot of people thought was suspect, was, in fact. But even just, I think, like what I've been thinking about the last few weeks is just how bizarre it was for a firm to kind of grow in the way it did and have the presence that it did, right? $130 million um, arena deal with Miami Heat, um, you know, million dollar properties in the Bahamas. I mean, they literally, Sam literally had restaurants there stay open 24-7, serve just vegan food for him. He racked up a $55,000 bill at the uh, Margaritaville. So a lot of these things, and that's factual, it's in the bankruptcy filings. A lot of these things in hindsight, it's like, actually, yeah, that stuff was weird. And we were talking about this before uh, we turned on the mic. I asked a lot of these questions, um, poked at especially the relationship between these two firms. But in hindsight, I think we, we, we didn't fully get to it. And it wasn't until we had that, that silver bullet, as it were, mm-hmm. the balance sheet that brought the entire house of cards to its knees. And <laughs> it's funny to, to sort of see, um, or it's not funny, it's unfortunate, but it is, it's, it's interesting that, um, for me at least, in hindsight, it, it makes sense that it was all kind of just yeah. a bunch of for gazy. So I have a couple of questions. One yeah. is, uh, assuming that what happened was Alameda had access to customer deposits, which I Again, it's alleged, but like I think a lot of people believe that uh, is the case. Um, if they'd never touched the customer funds, would the business have been as big? Like, could it have been true in terms of how profitable they were, how much capital they raised, like all these things? And it was actually like this one thing that they did brought it all down, but it would have been one of the great stories of entrepreneurship and and kind of business creation if they never actually crossed fund customer deposits over yeah. Alameda. And this is the Rubicon, which you should never cross, right? Um, yeah. In capital markets, this is the biggest no-no. It, well, they also appear to have told, again, I went back and I read some of the uh, user uh, kind of terms of service. Like they say they don't touch the funds. They said they don't touch the funds in the terms of service. They said it to me in interviews. They said it to regulators in conversations. Sam told me, he told regulators that there are these strict walls between the two firms. So yes, they were, that was erroneous. But 
to get to the heart of your question, which I think is deeply fascinating, is what could have happened here? And there's two possible scenarios, right? The first of which is it was a strong business. Alameda was printing money, doing very well as a trading firm. And then things slipped up around Terra Luna. Mm -hmm. And they had to think fast, act fast, and they made a decision to maybe borrow too much from their sister company or the worst case scenario, scenario actually tap into those funds to win it all back, as it were. That's sort of like... That's one possible situation. The other situation is, and this is where, and I talked to him about this on my show at the beginning of, or rather at the end of last year, the 2019 story. Um, and it seemed very conspiratorial at the time um, because it was so outlandish. What is the story? The story was that Alameda was a trading firm that made a really um, – outsized bet and did well on the kimchi trade of mm -hmm. sort of arbing between the Western exchanges and the, and the ones in Korea, um, South Korea, because there was this huge premium because of capital restrictions, um, cap capital outflow restrictions in that country. And so they made it big. And then there were, there were trades that went bust and Alameda was like in a really bad position and so they effectively launched FTX as a way to fill a hole that Alameda had. So going back to what I was saying before, it either was something that the, the, the sort of turn of events happened either very, you know, recently within the past six months, stemming from that original capital or credit crisis that the crypto market saw, or this is a much longer story, a much more insidious story that mm -hmm. stems back to the origin of of FTX and Alameda. What do you think it is? Well, here's the thing. Like, we don't necessarily have, and I don't have the the facts per se or evidence. There are sources I've talked to within Alameda who, who said that this backdoor, or at least this relationship between the firms have existed since the beginning. Mm -hmm. It's hard in this market, right, to kind of discern what people's motives are, what their intentions are, and whether or not they're speaking badly about someone because of their own book, mm -hmm. as, as it were. So it, it's difficult to say. We're going to find out a lot of interesting things in the coming days and weeks and months, and it's going to be, and then years afterwards. So it's, it's difficult to say, um, but if I were to, if I were to have a gun held to my head, no guns here, but go ahead. Good. I'm safe. <laughs> My head is safe. I, th I, th I, would, I think that it's been just completely mismanaged from the beginning. I think that, um, you know, there's a possibility of fraud, at least with respect to a misrepresentation to regulators. Let's put intentions aside. They don't really matter, right? They don't really, intentions don't really matter. People were hurt and lied to. Mm -hmm. And so that's where you can possibly run into some issues. And he... I mean, there was misrepresentations. I mean, even going back to the 2019 story that we first reported on FTX's launch, Sam said to us that they would he would imminently step down as CEO of Alameda. He didn't do that till the end of 2021. Mm -hmm. So there was nothing imminent about that. He also said that they were doing, in 2021, there were gap audits that showed the, the financial uh, stability of the business. John Ray, the current CEO, paints a very wildly different story of a lack of financial controls, a lack of basically everything you would expect from a business that's acting quasi as a shadow bank. There was nothing. I mean, they were approving, you know, expenses via, via Slack emojis. And, you know, what is, you know, if any other company was doing that, it would just be egregious. Like we would have maybe picked up on it a bit more, but... What they did so masterfully was really throw a bunch of glitter into our eyes, mm -hmm. if you think about it, right, with, with, with the sponsorship deals, with mm -hmm. um, just the je ne sais quoi that was his bizarre um, did they ever send aesthetic. You, did they ever send you guys uh, balance sheets or anything as like reporters? We never, we never got any sort of balance sheet yeah. from them. So no balance sheets, but also then like, what about like, 
gap financials or audits or anything like that. So they and told us that they had they had those, and at the end of 2021, they said they were going to be releasing the um, gap financials for 20. 20- 22, I think, or, or rather in 2022, they were going to release 2021. Mm-hmm. They never did. They, I don't know. Here's the other thing that I've been reflecting on. I don't know if we never, we never got them, but I also think so much was happening post COVID. Mm-hmm. And I, I spoke to Vanity Fair about this, the go-go era of crypto without the proper like controls and like self regulation mm-hmm or outside regulation from from regulators, I think allowed the market to kind of get out of control. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when you have, and and maybe this was part of their strategy, they were announcing things every week. Mm -hmm. So as a reporter, let's say you were on the FTX beat, it's very hard to sort of sit back and think, okay, what, what is weird here? Like we'd ask the questions, but to go deeper, because they were constantly putting out information where, we're opening up an office in Chicago. We have the Miami Heat deal. We're moving to Bahamas now. We're working with the Bahamian government on DARE. And they inundated the market with all this information. Mm-hmm. And in hindsight, it, it, it's reasonable to think that there was a strategic element there to, to distract while they fixed or, or, or did something else. Mm-hmm. Um, but these are some of the things I've been, I've been reflecting on. And there, there, there <laughs> a lot of... A lot of strange, um, strange stuff, right? Like even thinking about the effect of altruism, Mm -hmm. that is probably the one thing I I would kick myself about is, you know, going to Crypto Bahamas and seeing the, you know, where they lived, right? Did you go to the apartment? Not his apartment, but I I sort of, you know, did a tour de, de Nassau, as it were, and I mean, this is this is luxury. This isn't, you know, they, they weren't living like Talmudic monks, right? Mm-hmm. Like this is this is very antithetical to the sort of I drive a Corolla uh, mm-hmm. mantra that that was put out there, and I, I wish that I kind of picked up on that a little bit more. And what, what I thought at the time was almost okay, like you know, people make a lot of money in crypto. Let's say they're all living together it makes sense that they would go all in or sort of split the the costs, right? Mm-hmm. And, you know, if it's a $10 million house and 10, million, 10 people live in it, it's a million dollar house. I wouldn't, a million dollar house doesn't raise eyebrows, especially in this um, mm-hmm. market, right? So that's kind of how I thought about it. But in hindsight, definitely, definitely is a bit peculiar given the mm-hmm. sort of effective altruism and, and humility that underpinned yeah. a lot of the marketing. Do you think he's going to get in trouble? Or do you think that uh, it'll be like a whoops, made a mistake, uh, and well, he's definitely mistake. painting the the story as a whoops, I made a mistake. That's the toughest question, right? I mean, because there's a very fine line between um, mismanagement, being um, um, incapable of properly running a company, and fraud, right? Um, I believe that, you know, even in 2008, there was a lot of bad management. Mm-hmm. No one went to jail, right, except for that one guy who, like, uh, you know, misappropriated uh, Goldman Sachs's proprietary trading uh, algorithms data or whatever it was. And then you have Elizabeth Holmes, who is going to jail for 11 years. So I think on both sides, you, you, or rather in both instances, you would say people did things bad, but it doesn't necessarily translate into that sort of corporal punishment mm-hmm. necessarily. Does he get in trouble generally, like in a, in a very like deep sense? Yeah, I think he's in, he's in pretty big trouble. Yeah. Well, he's in trouble, but I mean, like, uh, I guess in the most extreme jail time, right, uh, barred from the financial industry, like, you can kind of go down the line. There's a bunch of punishments that historically have been levied I mean, against. John Corzine didn't spend a day in jail for MF yeah. Global, and they're similar. Mm-hmm. Um, again, whereas Elizabeth Holmes, right, like, basically lied to her investors, and she's spending quite a bit of time in jail. Yeah. And lied to regulators, I believe. Yeah. Um, what about the relationship between the— Bahamas and the United States? Because I would have thought um, pre this event, the United States and the Bahamas are friendly. If something happens that involves a U.S. citizen or U.S. customers or whatever, the Bahamas basically would say, hey, 
you guys are the United States, like do your thing. But I saw a letter that was sent from like the Bohemian security regulators. Mm-hmm. They were like, this is a Bohemian incident. Mm-hmm. Uh, you don't have jurisdiction here, basically, is what they were saying. And that surprised me. Is that, should I have been surprised? Maybe do I am not educated and didn't understand that that's the position they would take? Or, or what did you think about that? This episode is brought to you by 8 Sleep. Good sleep is a game changer and the 8 Sleep pod is the best sleep machine. I sleep on it every single night. A great night of sleep allows you to be healthier, be more rested, and have more energy throughout the day. And on the brand new 8 Sleep Pod 3, you can sleep as cold as 55 degrees Fahrenheit or as hot as 110 degrees Fahrenheit. That's the secret of thermoregulation. Better sleep, better energy. Get yourself an 8 Sleep. You can go to 8sleep.com slash pomp today to go ahead and get $150 off your order. 8sleep.com slash pomp. Not only do I sleep on it every night, it literally changed my life, and I begged the founders to let me invest in the company. 8sleep.com slash pomp. Go get yourself an 8 Sleep pod and get a better night of sleep. I wasn't surprised because the way that these bankruptcy proceedings work, Oftentimes you have disputes between jurisdictions, especially ones that are playing a shell game, right? So I wouldn't be surprised if you see other jurisdictions try to sort of step up to the plate and and carve out their part of the pie. Mm. With the Bahamas in particular, if I were to speculate, this is deeply personal, right? It's uh, well, what I mean by that is it's it 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 hits home for them in a unique way, right? It's a country of four hundred thousand people. And they really went in there and and usurped a lot of, like, energy, right? Um, there was the conference that they had. They, I mean, this is, this is a rumor. I'm going to share it because it's funny. I don't know if this is true. And I, right. hope, I hope, you know, folks forgive me for, for— Caveating a rumor. I am. But it's a funny rumor. It's not, it's not illicit or anything. Okay. So I'm going to share it. There's a story apparently early on when they first moved down there, um, Sam uh, got all the employees to the Bahamas. And uh, so there's a hundred of them and they rang up one of the local burrito places and asked for a hundred burritos by lunchtime. And the restaurant was, of uh, you know, they weren't, they weren't annoyed. They were just confused and said, we literally do not have the manpower to make that many burritos or, or not even the manpower, but the sort of like, the ingredients, the ingredients, and the, like the, the 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 infrastructure, capital infrastructure infrastructure to do it. So he bought them like three more ovens or something, so that they could like or stoves, so that they could um, produce as many burritos as needed for the FTX staff. And apparently, there's another restaurant where they uh, he basically paid them to stay open twenty four seven and offer vegan alternatives. So he, they really went in there and kind of like changed a bit of the fabric of the society. And and in the aftermath of this, I think these regulators and these government officials, like they know how deeply impacted their constituents are Mm -hmm. in a way that sure, millions of Americans were impacted. But I think there was a stat that like it was projected or um, um, expected that FTX contributed to 10% of the Bahamian GDP. Wow. So that's, I mean, I, I'm not surprised that they're trying to, you know, puff mm-hmm. their chest, right, to mm-hmm. at least show or at least exert their authority over something that so deeply was interwoven with the fabric of their small, um, with, with a smaller island nation. I went to the Bahamas once for an interview. Do you know this? No. With who? Uh, not with Sam. Uh, SBF and FTX were not there. Uh, I went and I interviewed John McAfee on his boat. Really? Oh, yeah. Is that that infamous picture of you and his me, and his wife? Me, John, and his wife with uh, they have guns and I do not. <laughs> so you know what's funny is I actually downloaded I got Snapchat again, uh-huh. and I had John's number from 2017. Okay, I called him a few times. Yep. You know, God rest his soul. And I, I, I coin of the day. That's what he was doing back then. That's what that yeah. was the good old days. But I opened Snapchat and it's like. John McAfee's Snapchat because it kind of loads yeah. your contacts. But I guess his number has gone to some kid who's like, you know. Who, who's like uploading stuff? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like this kid. You know, he doesn't know you who's You have number. no clue. You have no clue. <laughs> this man. This man. Uh, yeah. But I, I do remember, like, uh, I have a picture 
uh, what you made me think of is, uh, so I went, uh, one of my brothers came with me and, uh, he told us where we, they were and we got there and like, you know, I'm no fool. I, uh, gotta make sure that everything is, uh, on the up and up before uh, I go walk onto some dude's boat who I know mm-hmm. has a bunch of guns. So we kind of got there a little early and I went and I sat and there was like a bar, uh, kind of overlooking the like h- Harbor or whatever. Um, and, uh, and as I was sitting there, I saw a big ass wood sign and had the name of the place on it. And I walked down and across the top, they had put a second sign, like a, like a m- nicely made sign to the same quality as the original sign. And it said, home of John McAfee. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember thinking like, how much business has he brought to this little bar and to of this course. area? Right now, it wasn't 10% of the GP or anything like that. No, but but it like, was, that was one man. Exactly. This is a whole company that was worth, you know, supposedly exactly. $32 billion that basically did the exact same thing on a way bigger scale. And six months ago or however many months ago, we're breaking ground on a um, thousand person office. So Did they actually break ground? Like, were they building it? They, yeah. you know, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, where they kind of throw the dirt over. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But they were, but they were in the motion. The of doing ceremony. It. Is there a word for that? I don't know. Like the breaking ground. Breaking ground. Yeah, Cutting the ribbon, I think. Also. Yeah. But no, they hadn't laid that foundational, uh, the cornerstone, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, when you think of this whole situation, what's the like m- single most surprising part? Is it just that like it happened or is there something where you're like, I cannot believe this detail? Because there's a lot of them. It's all of the details, right? I mean, you know what's so funny is when I think back about like, FTX Alameda, the most egregious impropriety that I thought could be um, the case would have been that maybe Alameda like could see the order book faster or could access FTX's market faster. You know, going back to like the, the IEX sort mm-hmm. of like story of, you know, uh, Flash Boys, where maybe FTX or rather Alameda had more um, – more visibility into the market that was FTX relative to other traders. I couldn't possibly have imagined that Sam would have been so levered to the tits. I'll tell you, actually, the most surprising and upsetting, I think, fact is is that he borrowed money uh, or took, rather, BlockFi customer funds and that was borrowed by Alameda, which then bar- – BlockFi, I mean, I don't think they would know. I mean, they borrowed it to Alameda thinking that Alameda would use it for trading strategies. Alameda then lent that out to an entity owned by Sam, which then bought his stake in Robinhood. I mean, I just couldn't imagine – Run that back again? Say that again? Sorry, yeah. So Sam, I guess a more uh, clear way to put it, borrowed money from a shell company – which borrowed money from Alameda, which borrowed money from BlockFi, 300-something million dollars. And it was with that money, that leverage, levered, levered money, with which he bought his 7% stake in Robinhood. It's, 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 it's fucking crazy. That is wild. I did not know that. Yeah, that br- went out like a few days ago. Um, you're, you're, that's your job to know that stuff? <laughs> I mean, I just have I to, said, look, let me just come here. You're a wealth of knowledge. Teacher. Yeah, I just, you know. All right, so what are you going to do different? Because I think that you've like thought a lot about uh, how many times did you interview him? Six times on the show. But I mean. But talk to him or other people at the company many times throughout the years. Yeah, yeah. You know, it was, it was really good at and and he was very good at like speaking about a wide range of topics. So Mm -hmm. it kind of was almost like FTX at a certain point became boring. It was like, all right, they're growing their market share, whatever. But Mm -hmm. there's all this stuff happening in the market. Luna's melting down. There seems to be these credit issues. And so he was good about Solana was growing. All Mm -hmm. these different ecosystems were growing. And so a lot of the conversations were about those topics. Like, Mm -hmm. what do you think about? How, how, what's your strategy for serum? What's your opinion on sort of um, even what the Fed's doing, right? And he was so willing to opine on many of these on these topics that you, it, it almost sort of distracted from um, um, the core business. So when I think about what I might like, what I think is important for all of us to do for all of us to do is to 
you know, without being abrasive, like ask really tough questions. Mm-hmm. I think, I think you really, um, your interview with CNBC, like they were really tough. And I think you like handled those tough questions well. But they weren't done in a uh, malicious way yeah. where it was like, I'm going to yell and scream. I'm going like, yeah, to exactly. dunk on you or try to embarrass you. But they were like, there's, I think I said, it, like, they're fair questions. Yeah, there's no animus. And yeah. so with the podcast, like- I, Except or, for it was 20 minutes. It was long. Yeah, that I was a think, long day. I don't think I was. Uh, <laughs> I needed that like an IV after that. <laughs> <laughs> like 20 minutes on national television and like the heat's on. <laughs> Started sweating. <laughs> yeah, that's tough. Uh, I think just in general, like I always, I've always viewed my job over the past, you know, I've been doing this for not that long, seven years, um, as kind of being a conduit for investors and clients of, of these companies that I cover. Mm-hmm. And ask the questions that they would ask if they had the opportunity to sit mm-hmm. across from somebody. Um, I'm gonna. I think we need. I need to be a little bit meaner, <laughs> a little bit more. Yeah. Uh, to well, the it, point. it's it's a good question, right? Because people accuse me all the time of uh, softball interviews, all this stuff. Yeah. Right? And uh, one one of them, um, I had. Uh, uh, Let's see a good example. I had Chris Larson mm-hmm. um, on the uh, podcast, and I don't think him nor I were confused that like we didn't see eye to eye on some things. Mm-hmm. But it was like a, I want to ask you these questions so that I can get the answers, other people can get the answers, and then like people will decide what they want to decide, but like answer the questions. To his credit, he said, "Yeah, sure, let's do it." So he got on. I don't think I asked easy questions. Like I, mm-hmm. I was like, "Hey, you realize that there's no one person in the world who could change the code of Bitcoin, mm-hmm. right?" And he was like, "Well, yeah," which contradicted what had publicly been said in the change the code um, uh, kind of initiative. But there was other things that he explained when kind of elaborated on that people had read that maybe his view uh, wasn't nearly as egregious as they had previously thought or whatever. And so I've always approached it as just like, it's important to have conversations with the people you agree with and the people you disagree with. And by the way, it's not like I th- walked out of that conversation or he walked out of that conversation and was like, oh, I changed my mind. Mm-hmm. But still getting the information is important. And so I think part of it is like, if you're an asshole to everyone, people don't talk to you. That's the thing. Yeah. Right. So it's like, like, how do you find find the balance? And and I think to your point, like you can ask tough questions in a nice way. And some people may not be able to realize that that's actually a tough question. Yeah. Because like, oh, he did it with a smile. Yeah. Or they're, they're laughing. But like, if you had said, uh, hey, Sam, where'd you get the money for buying 7% of Robinhood? Mm Mm-hmm. Like, that's a pretty direct question, and either he answers it or he doesn't. Uh, and almost in some way, a non-answer is telling you a, a detail? Yeah, totally. To pay attention to? I mean, what I am, um, I'm, I'm very I'm very proud that we did, at least as a firm, we did ask these questions. We've been asking them for years. Um, but you always want to be, you always want to be better. Um, so I just wish we asked them instead of on a, like, Twice a year basis, like an every week basis. Yeah, but like uh, we were talking earlier. And <clears throat> so when all this news broke, somebody on Twitter, of course, is like, you guys are all fucking morons. Like you idiots. Yeah, that, how'd you not know? That, in, that either interviewed these people or um, uh, they were the U.S.-based entity uh, at FTX, uh, worked with our media business as an advertiser, as did a bunch of other companies. Um and they were like, how did you not know? And I was like, well, what question would you have liked us to ask? <laughs> and this uh, genius slash smart ass said, you should have asked if they were taking FTX customer deposits, lending it to a, their hedge fund, who was then posting it as collateral, getting leverage, and then buying risky assets. Okay. Interesting combination of things you want to put together there in that question with hindsight. Uh, and if I asked them, then they just said, no, what are you going to do? Right. And so like to your guys' point, like you, even if you ask the questions, if somebody just says, no, we don't do that. And it turns out they do do that. How, what, what is the expectation? Like how, how could you have known? Right. And that, that's what becomes kind of hard. It's an interesting question. I mean, and it, I think it, it forces us to, it forces people in a position like, like your position to maybe scale back from certain folks. I mean, I remember when we started the block, um, one thing that we we sort of decided not to do because of how many people got burnt by the ICOs was not do any advertising with any sort of ICO company. Um, of course, token projects have come, you know, into the market that are far more legitimate. Um, and, and so, you know, are probably 
would make folks more comfortable to to take their ad ad dollars. And we're kind of we'll, we'll maybe we'll see something similar with these centralized crypto brokers and retail platforms where maybe we won't. It'll be it'll, we'll think twice or we'll think three times or ask more questions. Not, I mean, I agree with with your point that like yes, you can be lied to, but maybe you know folks in media will look for other opportunities um, that are outside this more retail facing realm. Maybe, um, you know, athletic greens, which is a sponsor of my podcast <laughs> or other brands of that. I'm an investor in athletic. Greens. Are you really? Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> wow, this is very incestuous. Go, go ahead. I hope they're not stealing. I hope they're not stealing uh, customer funds. And <laughs> well, the only thing they're stealing is my 30 minutes of my morning where I enjoy uh, delicious athletic greens <laughs> And it gets me ready for the day. No, wh- one of the things, though, I, I do think is uh, it's something we're actively thinking through. I don't know how, kind of how we're going to deal with it. Uh, it is different, though, when you're like, hey, there's a product that is yeah. advertising. Like you give your money to Athletic Greens or, or Eight Sleep, uh, which everyone loves to give you shit about. Why, um, why, do they, why do they give you such a hard time? Is, I but, lo- but it's I love, important. Listen, like the, the market, Sleep was the market started changed. by two of my best friends. Yeah. Right. Literally two of my best friends. Uh, I'm an investor in the business. I've helped them for a long time, all this stuff. And uh, some of it was timing, like (laughs) all this stuff starts happening, whatever. Uh, But also (laughs) uh, we had made a video for uh, social media or whatever. And it's just me. Hey, I I sleep on the eight sleep. I've talked about it. I've ad nauseum talked Mm -hmm. about this for years, right? Uh, How much I'm like, I love this product. And so we made this video. I posted it. It did well. And they were like, hey, are you cool if we put some ad dollars behind it? Mm-hmm. Sure, whatever, mm-hmm. right? Like, I didn't think twice about it. Next thing I know, they're very good at performance marketing. <laughs> all over Facebook, Instagram, like all this shit, and it's me. <laughs> like, basically, like, almost like a spokesperson. And people are like, the bear market is so bad. Yeah. Like, pomp shilling mattresses. <laughs> <laughs> and, like, look, I, I'm a human. I love the internet. I'm like... That's check, check. The market is bad. You, you, the, yeah. You guys, you got me like, that was a good one. That was, that was a good one. <laughs> and so, uh, like in some ways, like the feedback, like I listen, right. I, I see it. Uh, it makes you laugh, but also it's like, that's different. If somebody goes and they buy a mattress and like, I don't like the mattress. That's different than somebody puts their assets into a platform and you can say all you want. Like I went back and I looked, I, I have like tweets where people are like tweeting at me. I'm like, Hey, I don't speak for the company, but like, here's the frequently asked questions, do your own research, underwrite the risk, whatever. But like, still it's a product that like their money is sitting there versus buying a, a product. And I think that there's differences to that. Right. And, and so like, we're trying to think through like, Hey, how do you, how do you navigate this? Especially in a world that's like, it's built on finance. Mm-hmm. There's no clear answer. It's it's just it's difficult, and I think like our job is, it's it's required that we like think very hard, especially mm-hmm. about the way we you know um, advertise things, write about things, talk about things, um, especially as it pertains to um, financial services products. Right? We've we we go through our scripts. We're very diligent and think um, very hard about the language that we use. You know, we, 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 we appreciate our sponsors, of course, but we try to um, stray from superlatives that might be a bit um, overstated. Um, but yeah, it's not, it's, 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 it's not as simple as, you know, some of your trolls might think, which I think is the bottom line. Um, meme lords, I like to the call meme them. lords. Yes. But it's, it's, it's interesting. Um, you've kind of gone through your own, um, transition in a way. This is Frank trying to change the interview. uh, (laughs) First off, you, um, so you were here in your lovely offices. This is the, this is the family office plus the, um, the other, the other firm that you're sort of running. Yes. What's the pomp empire look like today? That's it. That's it. Yeah, that's it. (laughs) Run the business and invest. Nice. It's, um, I just try to do the things I enjoy doing. Mm-hmm. Like, I think that's another thing, right? Like if you look at obviously the BlockFi situation, uh, we, I wasn't an investor in FTX, but I'm an investor, I don't know. I've probably invested across every fund that I've managed uh, and my own capital, maybe 200 companies, right? Or 150, 200, whatever. It's some big number. And when you look at it, I think one of the things that people forget is that like that's the business of investing is taking risk. And you risk capital. And if you are wrong, for whatever reason, whether it's that company's fault, somebody else's fault, whatever, you lose money. 
Mm-hmm. Like that is the feedback cycle. Uh, if you're right, usually you make a lot of money. And venture capital tends to be an industry where it is not about being right more times than wrong. It's actually about being really, 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 really right a few times and actually being wrong most of the time. What do you do when a bet is turning against you? I, I know one Nothing. investor. Not, so that's interesting because there was one investor I know who flew to the Bahamas to get some answers from Sam. So in, in that situation, right, uh, I'm assuming, I, I, don't know, I think he said on national television. Oh, uh, oh did he say, yeah. yeah, okay, yeah. He said on national television. Okay, good. Um, and so like in that situation, I think it's because uh, there is um, – where there was smoke, there was the thought there might be fire, mm-hmm. I think, right? Uh, but like in other situations where a company uh, is even struggling, like you get on the phone, you talk to the founder, you, you try to be helpful, but like you're not running the company, right? And every investor will tell you, I have founders I've talked to, they're like, I don't know what to do, tell me what to do, and like I'll do it. And you give them the best information you can or you introduce them to somebody who's been through that situation before, sometimes they follow it to a T and it doesn't work. Sometimes they fall to a T and it works. Most of the time, though, they're like, thank you for your opinion. Yeah. <laughs> I'll call you if I need you. Yeah. <laughs> and they go and they do whatever they want. Right. Yeah. And so like, but like, that's ultimately what you're betting on. It's like you're betting on the people, especially if you're an early stage investor, to run the company. And so I think that like, one of the promises of this whole industry is like capitalism, and free markets and all that kind of stuff. And I think the FTX situation is interesting because really it was the crypto market that essentially self-regulated. Now, it was turbulent, didn't feel good, but like somebody leaked a balance sheet to a crypto reporter Mm -hmm. or a reporter at a crypto media company, Mm -hmm. which then provided the market information. And then market participants decided to take actions based on that information that ultimately led to the downfall of the second largest crypto exchange. It's not like somebody showed up from an auditing firm and was like, oh, look at this thing, right? So I think like that same ethos plays out when things go right or, or they don't. But like, the people who are investing the capital in the businesses, you don't hear them complaining. You don't hear them um, like being upset because I think they know what they're kind of signed up for, right? It's Do you think users, to an though. extent though, they played a role in sort of creating a, a capital markets uh, for crypto that were highly incentivized to take on a lot of risk, right? When, when the money's flowing in, you know, John Mack, said this, that uh, he was the CEO of, um, was it was it Merrill Lynch or mm-hmm. one of the big banks? Yeah, I think Merrill Lynch. And he said, well, the music's playing, you've got to dance. And all of these lenders, there was kind of a race to the bottom, as it were, in terms of thinking through collateral um, and rates and just being hyper aggressive. That was fueled in part by the ample amounts of uh, venture funds that could sort of feed into that frenzy. Yeah, I don't know how much uh, venture dollars, like there was a lot invested, but if you look at these companies, like how much total did, take FTX as an example, how much total do they raise? A billion? Billions. Bill, two billion? Yeah. Right? So like, let's say they raise two billion. That's on the higher end for sure. But like, there are other companies that raised a billion or $2 billion in technology in general. Right. Uh, if you look at other companies, it's less, hundreds of millions, mm-hmm. but still that's a shit ton of money. Right. Um, and so when you look at it, like overall, I actually don't think that much money really went into the top companies compared to what people think it is. Like it was happening so fast. And to your point, like prices were going up so quickly. But if you actually take a step back and you look, was it more or less than $10 billion? Mm. I don't know, right? We sure. we'd have to go do the math. But look, let's say it was less than $10 billion. That is a really, really big number. But the overall market cap was hitting $3 trillion. So if $10 billion of venture went in and you got $3 trillion from an industry and you have to do, make sure the numbers are correct, but like that's like a very small amount of capital to create $3 trillion of value. Now, that doesn't, it's not as clear cut because you have to look and say like, okay. I wouldn't just say though, it's not just the money. I think your point is right. But also the expectation, right, of the venture capitalist for when you raise that next round, right? You want to show hockey stick. Oh, that's venture capital across the board. And and to show that you need to, you need to sort of 
undercut your competitors. And it, it was a, quite the competitive market, quite, quite a crowded market. With yeah, if you look Celsius, at- Celsius, Nexo, BlockFi, Genesis. So you can then, look at like crypto, but I, I would just say zoom out from just the crypto industry. It's like- the same things that drove Uber and Lyft to fight with each other mm -hmm. and like spend a shit ton of money, uh, all of the driver incentives, the rider incentives, the rebates, like all that stuff. It's the same. I think it's totally 100%. the same. And so like to your point, uh, venture capital is a home run business. It mm -hmm. is a asymmetry business. And like asymmetry doesn't occur because you grow 10% year over year. Right. And yeah. so regardless of the industry, like that is the business of venture capital. And like most things, there's a lot of good that's come out of it. I'm saying like a, a, a VC backed venture capital backed financial markets is, can be dangerous. Oh, as we've seen. As we've yeah. seen. Yeah. yeah. Um, but also and the collateral thing, I think is the big, is the big other boogeyman here, which is, you know, in hindsight, Alameda and FT or Alameda were, they were, borrowing money with collateral tied to the firm themselves. So you have this wrong way collateral that effectively doubles down the risk of their counterparty, right? Because if the collateral is, let's say the collateral was Gatorade, if FTX goes down, doesn't impact Gatorade, the collateral is still good. But if FTX goes down and your collateral serum, mm -hmm. FTT, Solana to an extent, Mm -hmm. that's, that's it's not a different game. That's bad. Yeah. But. I, I do think, um, there's a lot of people, I mean, I, I was a pretty big, um, critic of the ICO mania. It sounds like you guys were as well, uh, back in 2017, 2018. Um, I literally got booed off a stage. I don't know if I ever told you this. Mm. Uh, there was a, uh, a battleship <laughs> should have known already. The conference was on a battleship. <laughs> um, and, uh, I was invited to speak. I went, it was a fireside chat. Me and the, uh, the, uh, was it with Ian Bellina? No. <laughs> uh, it was the guy who ran the conference and he uh, was asking me questions and I was honest. I said, Hey, I don't think, you know, I think that if you're doing this stuff, like it's probably going to be unregistered securities or whatever. And they were like booing me. And then as I was wow. leaving the conference, the next guy on the stage was like, don't listen to that guy. That guy's an idiot. I was like, wow. Okay. <laughs> so like haters, I've been dealing with this for a long time. Like, welcome to the party. Um, but I do think your point about like, there will be changes happening in the industry. Mm -hmm. My last question for you is just like, what do you think the changes will be? Well, I think we're going to rethink what, what collateral is and, and the sort of parameters around how these centralized crypto brokers, mm -hmm. lenders operate. We've tried several times in the past. And but, um, we is carrying a lot of weight. I've not been involved in sort of the <laughs> self-regulatory. Frank is yeah. actually the pseudonymous he, person Yeah, behind. exactly. I'm the hand that, <laughs> that sort of, well, we could talk about the fact that I feel like a lot of the times I put out a story about a trend and then whatever that trend is tanks. And I think there's a whale who's counter trading my, counter -trading. my, my art, my articles, my news be that anyway, <laughs> moving on from that. I swear Maybe it was Sam could have been. Could have been. Um, Would you be mad if you found that out? No, I mean, it is it is what it is, but it's happened quite a bit. Like I've written like pieces where I'm like just looking at the data, volatility is at an all-time high. And the next day, it just completely like falls <laughs> off a cliff. It happens all the time. You should write an article about how Bitcoin's price is going down. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I think that these agencies tried to come to the fold and they really didn't have that much success in kind of creating parameters around how these firms should engage with each other. There's been attempts um, by various folks, but none of them have really taken off. I think we need to get serious about that. And I think that if we don't, the regulators certainly will will force our hand in doing that. Um, I think that's the big thing. Like, just like th this was a this was a problem of of the way our capital markets in crypto functioned, mm -hmm. with a lack of controls, a lack of risk management, a lack of counterparty risk management, and I think that's what changes. And if it doesn't, then then it's it's going to be difficult for just the fl the sort of you know capital formation to happen in this market. I think that you'll see DeFi rails step in, right? I think DeFi lending protocols will sort of have their moment, right, where um, people might think about the the sort of the element of transparency being beneficial relative to what was going on at some of these desks. And um, 
I'm hopeful for that. I'm hopeful for those two things sort of um, es- establishing themselves and and creating a stronger foundation um, from which we can exit out of this this crisis. Um, but I'm more hopeful than I was three weeks ago. I mean, it was kind of like the fog of war had still, you know, was still hanging over our head. Now I think, you know, especially with, you know, Knockwood Bitcoin sort of keeping its price level as it is, that's that's a good sign. Um, it's not, it's not, you know, it doesn't feel quite, it, it doesn't, it feels more like dramatic and like almost entertaining and, and, and bizarre, emphasis on bizarre than 2017. Mm-hmm. Or 2018, but it doesn't sound as um, doesn't feel rather as hopeless. Yep. I mean, 2019 was pretty pretty grim, but we're still here. We're still here. All right, where can All we right. send people to find you on the internet? Just you can get me at at the uh, at fintech Frank. <laughs> I don't know why this is funny. It's just so what's my Twitter handle? <laughs> um, and then theblock.co. We changed our URL since last time I was on the, the show. Theblock.co. Mm-hmm. Who's got the com, dot .com? So you know what's funny? I think theblock.com is like an Australian home improvement show. <laughs> you have a mustache that could be the contractor on that show. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then there's another one like theblock.io is like a – I'm pretty sure like a Peruvian restaurant in Arlington, Virginia. So shout out to them. Yeah, they probably get some traffic from you guys. (laughs) Awesome. All right, we'll do it again in the future. Thank you. Thanks.